Took me a long time to sort that out, and it's like he's been everywhere. This tramp, he's been everywhere, and and he knows he's he's traveled the world, and 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 he, but he doesn't have a place. He doesn't have a home. He, he hasn't made a relationship with anything real yet. He's he's kind of a potential, and this is one of the things that's really interesting about this movie because if you think about the cricket as a fragment of the of the hero and say a, a reflection of the of the savior, which is his relationship with JC, of course, and the person who introduces the book then the, the story gets strange, because if it was merely a representation of the perfect person, the archetype of the hero then the conscience would know everything, right? and it would just tell the puppet what to do, and that would be the end of it but that, first of all, that's a dull story, it's like perfect conscience comes along, puppet does everything it says bingo, perfection but that isn't what happens, there's this weird idea that this thing that's got all these attributes needs a home and has to enter into a learning relationship with the thing that it's trying to transform it's so sophisticated, because you know, I could say, you should do what your conscience tells you it's like, well, maybe not, maybe that's not exactly how it works maybe your conscience isn't omniscient and omnipotent, maybe it's not God, right? it's a guide, but it's, it's, it's it's maybe smarter than you sometimes, maybe because it's society in your head and obviously it's smarter than you sometimes, because it tells you not to do something and you go do it and then you get into trouble and you think, well if I would have just listened, but you don't and that's interesting too, it's something that you don't have to listen to which is, seems to be associated with free will, it's weird, it's like if your conscience knows what to do why aren't you just a deterministic puppet of your conscience? Christ, that would work a lot better, you wouldn't have to torture yourself, and you wouldn't make any mistakes, so why the separation? well, maybe it's because the conscience is generic and so it has to be taught, it has to learn too, and so what you do is you have a dialogue with your conscience it's something like that, and then you expose yourself to more and more of the world, and you get wiser, and your conscience gets wiser, and you, you mature together and that's what happens in this story, because the cricket starts out as a, this tramp that you know, is smarter than the puppet, but not as smart as he thinks he is, that's for sure and when he first starts to operate as a conscience, he's completely useless at it he babbles off a lot of cliches about morality, and then he's late the first day for his job and he's just not very good at it, and so there's this weird idea that the conscience, which is part of what puts you towards redemption is something that you actually have to interact with over the course of your life in order for it to develop as you develop and so then I would also say that the cricket represents, at least in part, what Jung described as the self which is like the potential, fully developed human being that sort of exists within you as a possibility but it has to be, it has to be manifest in the actual conditions of your life and so the conscience has to learn how to position itself here and now and it's, it's got generic advice, and that's not good enough and so that's why the cricket is looking for a home, and so he needs a home even though he's all these other things we already said he was he has to find a specific home before he can become who he could be well, so then Geppetto shows up, and he's a kindly old guy, which is pretty much exactly what you'd expect and, you know, he, he's a careful craftsman, and he likes kittens, and you know, that's always a good thing and he has some fish, and you know, he's and he's good at making things, and he's got a sense of humor, and he's kind of playful, and so he's, he's, he's the good father, fundamentally he's the wise king, he's the positive archetype of the masculine, and that's what he is, and so he's culture in its positive manifestation, and he gives rise to this creation, which is his puppet, which is what culture does, because you're a puppet of your culture, you're a marionette of your culture, and so maybe you could be more than that and that's the other thing that's strange about this movie, and it's strange about the mythological way of looking at the world, because scientifically, deterministically, there's nature and there's culture, and you are the deterministic product of the interaction between nature and culture. There's nothing else to you than that. That's that. But the mythological world doesn't say that. It says something different. It says that there's nature and culture, and then there's you. And the you that's in there has choices and a destiny, and that you actually affect the interplay of nature and culture in determining your own character and it insists upon that, the oldest stories we have, there's always the hero and the archetypal mother and the archetypal father there's always those three things, there's never just two so, 
from the narrative perspective, there's always the implication that there's something autonomous about the, the hero of the story. And, you know, you can't account for that. We don't have a good way of accounting that, for that from a scientific perspective. I was having a discussion with Sam Harris the other day, which was very... Um, what would you say? He said we got wrapped around an axle, which is pretty much Sam Harris is one of the four famous, you know, atheists, along with Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and uh, Dan Dennett. Yeah, and so we were having a discussion, and um, he's a determinist, just right down to the bottom. It's like you're determined. You're determined. There's no free will. You're a deterministic machine. And you know, if you're a coherent scientist and you're a Newtonian, roughly speaking, you don't really have much choice other than to think that way. But that isn't how it seems to people. And we don't treat each other that way. And our entire legal system is predicated on the idea that you do, in fact, have free will. So, well, can we account for it? Well, no. And do we have a scientific model for it? No. But then I would also say, we do not have a scientific model for consciousness. We don't know a damn thing about consciousness. Which is why Dan Dennett's book, which was called Consciousness Explained, was referred to its, by its critics as Consciousness Explained Away. Which is exactly right, as far as I'm concerned, because he took a mechanistic approach, and I just don't think you get to do that, because there's something really weird about consciousness. I mean, the, the phenomenologists like Heidegger, who tried to radically transform Western philosophy right from the bottom up, he basically said, well, you know, you can treat the world as if consciousness is primary, and that human experience is reality, that's reality. And that it doesn't exist independently of consciousness in any explicable way. It's like, well, what's out there if there's nothing to, to experience it? Well, everything at once, it's something like that. It's, it's not really comprehensible. as Without a subject, the subject defines it and makes it real. Now, you don't have to believe that, but, but at least I'm telling you that there are thoroughly coherent philosophical positions that make that case very strongly and that, that allow consciousness to exist as a phenomena and to take it seriously and you certainly act like you take it seriously you act like there's a you and that you make choices and you certainly treat other people that way deterministic or not, you're still going to get angry when they're being you know, rude to you and you're going to act as if they had some choice in the matter now maybe that's an illusion, possibly but maybe it's not and I would say the oldest stories that we have always include that as not only a fundamental element, but even as the fundamental element. So, well, so you can think about that however you want. But anyway, so Geppetto comes along and he's going to finish off the puppet. And so what does he do to finish off the puppet? He gives it a, it's, he gives it a voice. He gives it a mouth. Well, that's really, really interesting. So, in Genesis, in, in Genesis, this is a, this is a very very, very complex idea, and it, it took people thousands of years to figure this idea out and it's something like this, so at the beginning of everything, there was chaos and that was like potential, it was something like potential the potential for being and God, who's God the Father in the Genesis account, uses a faculty that he has, which is the word to call being from chaos, and that's the creation of being, right, it's the it's the manifestation of order from chaos and it's the word, the logos that, it's, it's the logos, that's the tool that God uses to do that and that logos in Christianity is associated with Christ, which is a very weird thing and, but the reason for that is that there's an idea that the divine element of the individual is the thing that uses language, communicative language to call the world into being and that is what we do, as far as we can tell, it's like you make a decision, you think it through, you talk it over with your friends, you plot a course, and the world manifests itself in relationship to your choice. And it's for that reason, and it is for that reason, that in Genesis and in many other accounts, that, that Logos capacity is identified with human beings. It's like you have a small bit of that in you, whatever that means, and you participate in the process of continually generating order out of chaos, and, and sometimes the reverse, you mediate between them and so, and that, if, that in, our, in, in, in western culture, and, and it's, it's certainly the case in other cultures as well that that's why you have rights, fundamentally, that's why the law has to respect you is because you've got this spark of divinity in you that's transcendent, that nobody gets to transgress against and you say, well, do you believe that? it's like, well, you act like you believe it 
you treat other people like you believe it, or they're not very happy with you so, it depends on what you mean by believe, you act it out, well, do you accept it as a proposition? Well, I don't care if you accept it as a proposition, frankly, because I think the best indicator of what you believe is how you act, not what you say because what do you know about what you know? hardly anything and so, actions speak louder than words and if you want to be treated properly by someone, what that means is that you want to treat them, you want them to treat you as a valuable, autonomous entity that's what you want and so, maybe you're not that, maybe you're a deterministic puppet and what this strange movie suggests is that you are kind of a deterministic puppet, but that you don't have to be alright? well, you, the mouth goes on and then Geppetto's happy about that, and then they have a little dance, you know, they, they turn the music on and all these little music boxes, and they all play together and it's like harmony of some sort has been established, because that's what the music represents and the, there's layers of reality that are communicating with one another, because that's what the music represents and then they have a little dance, and the idea is that, well, it's a good thing to let this puppet have its own voice well, that's an interesting idea, because what the hell does it know? It's a wooden-headed marionette, why the hell would you want something like that to talk? Well, it's the same question you have in relationship to your children It's like, what do they know? They're two, or three, you know, they don't know anything Well, so should you just, like, tyrannize them and make them do everything you want, or are you going to let them have a bit of a voice? And the question is, it depends on whether you want them to be a puppet or not and if you don't want them to be a puppet, if you want them to grow up autonomous, then you let them have a voice and you facilitate the development of that voice and so, and, 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 that's, and that's what you do if you don't want a marionette so, and Geppetto doesn't want a marionette, so he gives the puppet a voice, even though he knows it's just a puppet and that it's, it doesn't know anything and then, this is fantastic, so the cricket's sitting up there watching that, he's pretty happy with it, that's the first little scene you see there and he's sitting by this other thing that is just not happy at all and it, that's the terrible father and you see, it's a character that repeats throughout the entire movie, you see manifestations of the tyrannical father continually through the movie in different characters, like he's played out by different roles and so, first of all the cricket is so thrilled about this and then he looks at the, the frowning king there Who's, who is not happy that the puppet has been given a voice, he's a tyrant, right, he's the representation of a tyrant and a tyrant does not want you to have a voice and so the cricket looks at him and says, well you can't please everybody all the time and it's just this tiny little fragment of a joke, you know, but it's, there's this old idea I think it comes from Chekhov and, and the idea is that if you set a play up and, and there's a gun, a rifle or a pistol on a table in the first act it better have been used by the third act or it shouldn't have been there at all and the idea is, you don't put anything in your play that, that's random you never do that, it's like, because this isn't life that, that, this isn't life, this is a work of art, and everything is connected and, and it's, con you know, it's, it's there by intent and so this isn't accidental that this little king character doesn't like what's going on, or that he shows up so anyways, all, all the clocks go off, and the music boxes go, and they have a little dance, and everybody's happy about it and, and then, Geppetto notices what time it is, and so there's a tremendous emphasis on time in this part of the movie because there are all these clocks are going off, and they're all telling him what time it is, like 30 clocks go off and then he takes his watch out and notices what time it is, it's like the idea that there's something about time going on is like whacked at you, you know, dozens of times so that you get it and it's a little joke that he, you know, pulls out his watch and he figures out it's time for bed well, so now we're making a transition between the conscious world and the unconscious world okay, so, so there's an intimation in the movie that everything that happens now is in the unconscious world and the way you know that is that it's, it's strange, because the movie moves in and out of this underworld but at the very end, when Pinocchio is transformed into a real boy the last thing Geppetto does is, I think it's Geppetto, is hit one of the pendulums and start all the clocks again so it's as if what happens from here onwards is part of a dream now it's, it's murky because Pinocchio goes to school and you know, there's the next day and all of that but, and so those are sort of realistic elements but then there's also the whole going down into the ocean to find the whale thing which seems completely dreamlike and, but there's an intimation that we're in a different kind of world and, and so we go to, they all go to sleep, including the cricket and so then Geppetto notices the star and 
because he's a good guy, he makes a wish on the star, and we've already explained why you might wish on a star and what that might mean and he makes a very interesting wish um, it's, it's not a self-serving wish, in, in fact it's quite the contrary he doesn't wish that Pinocchio is an obedient son, he doesn't wish that he's produced someone who will work for him he doesn't wish any of that, he wishes what a good father would wish which is that the creation that he's brought forth would develop its capacity for autonomy he wants him to become real, he wants him to become an actual living creature and not a wooden headed marionette and so you'd say, well that is what your father should wish for you, you know, and I have clients frequently whose fathers weren't like that at all they were tyrannical or they were neglectful or, or they punished this, them, the person every time they did something good that's a real fun game they competed with them and undermined them at every opportunity they didn't want to produce someone strong and autonomous they wanted to give birth to a slave and then diminish it as much as possible and so that's bad it's not good, and that's so Geppetto's not like that, so he says, well, I'm going to wish for something completely unreasonable which is that part of that ideal idea, right? and the unreasonable thing is that this puppet could become real, could actually take on its autonomy and, and move forward and so that's what he wishes and then they go to sleep and then the cricket starts to become driven mad by the noises of the clock and so it's like he's, he's going into this sort of state of hyper alertness and the clocks are clanging at him and Geppetto is snoring and, and the, he can even hear the little grains of sand falling out of the, out of the hour, hourglass he's becoming hyper alert, hyper alert and then he yells stop and all the clocks stop which is a pretty good trick for a cricket, you know, it's like he's the master of time, but also we're in a place now where time has come to a stop, we're outside of time and one of the things that Freud pointed about dreams is that dreams are kind of outside of time now, here's what that means, is, is first of all, they draw on eternal themes, that's part of it, but you know, you must have had this experience, and Freud noted this carefully in the interpretation of dreams, where you know, you're sleeping, and the alarm goes off, and the alarm noise is incorporated into your dream and it's like the dream has been going on for an hour in subjective time and you wake up and you realize that it's the alarm clock it's like, and there's no reason why your dream time should be the same as real time because it's all going on in your imagination but it's amazing in some sense how much can happen in such a short period of time in your imagination and so it's outside of time the world of fantasy is in some sense out of, outside of time and so the cricket tells time to stop and it does and then the star enlarges and it turns into this blue fairy who's got a celestial gown covered with stars and who's got wings so she's kind of some ethereal being and like you don't have a problem with that in the movie it's like yeah sure I mean you know it's a fairy it came from a star that makes perfect sense which of course it, does, it makes no sense whatsoever right it makes no sense but you're willing to go along with it because on the one hand it makes sense, no sense, and on the other hand it, it makes perfect sense it's like the fairy godmother idea, it's like yeah yeah, fairy godmother, no problem, we, we got that and, it's, and the idea there is that, well nature comes to your aid, it's something like that it's, it's, it's the, the benevolent force of nature is on your side, now not obviously only on your side, because it opposes you as well but, and there's your own mother as well, who's also nature, who's on your side, and so but there's an idea here, and the idea is that if the father gets the wish right, the aim right for the child, then nature will cooperate. Right. And that's true. I believe that's true. Is that if you set up your relationship, your cultural relationship with your child properly, then they're far more likely to flourish. And so you get the magic of nature on your side by establishing the proper aim. And so that's what happens. Geppetto says, well, this is what I'm this is what I'm aiming at and because he's aiming at, at it, and because it's within the realm of possibility, nature comes to his service and that is how it works, it, that's exactly how it works because when you aim at something, then you muster your biological forces towards that goal and if the goal is feasible and attainable, then you will cooperate with yourself and so that's quite cool, Carl Rogers would call that, what's the word for that? I think he called it genuineness, which is kind of weak 
but, but I, think, I think that's still what he called it, he sort of meant that, well that's sort of what happens when, you're, when your goals and your physiological and your, your biological being are aligned well and, you're, and you can communicate both, you're not full of internal contradictions and so your conscious aims and your biological possibilities are manifesting themselves in the same direction and so, well that would be good so anyways, the fairy shows up, and she's quite sexually attractive, she's quite provocative and she, she charms the cricket and who gets all blushes and like is all, you know, embarrassed and overwhelmed by this like figure of celestial beauty and decides to cooperate, the conscience decides to cooperate and gets some responsibility and so the fairy allows the puppet to move without strings so that's kind of interesting, so it's the intervention of nature culture focuses the aim, and then it's the intervention of nature that produces the autonomy and that seems to be right, I mean, even though it's not that understandable, it seems to be right and then, so, she takes the strings off Pinocchio and you might say, well that's partly because your child is not, certainly, not just a creature of culture by no means, your child has a temperament, you'll see that right away and that temperament will unfold and hopefully it will unfold in a cultural context that's amenable to it and that the combination of those two things will produce something new he can talk he can walk and so the good fairy basically tells him that he's got a bit of autonomy and now it's up to him to like clue in a bit and act properly and learn the difference between good and evil and to speak truthfully and all that, it's a bit uh, propagandistic, that part of the movie, I would say, but it doesn't really matter, it's kind of inculcation of conventional morality and there's a fair bit to it, especially that he's supposed to tell the truth and, uh, you know, he says he will, and the cricket's listening, and then the puppet asks, well, what does conscience mean? because the fairy says, always let your conscience be your guide, and he says, well, what does conscience mean? and then the bug, who's like all puffed up because he wants to impress the fairy, pops down and gets on his little matchbox and gives this like horrible little lecture about how to behave properly that's just like ideological chatter, you can hardly even stand listening to it, and it's supposed to be like that it's generic moral advice that anyone could give that's kind of dull and, and also puffed up and grandiose, and he's just not very good at it so, and that's why he's on his little matchbox there with his chest puffed out and so, he says, that's just the trouble with the world today and, uh, and I think that's his opening line, you know that, that he's diagnosing the whole world and, you know, the fairy she thinks he's kind of funny, because he is and, you know, it's sort of, there's a real interesting thing here going on because he's male and he's, he's all puffed up with, with his knowledge, which is completely shallow and then he's put in contact with this like celestial feminine ideal and he just turns into a complete moron and that's exactly what happens to men, it happens to them all the time so, anyways, she decides to give him a chance and turns him into this conscience and all of a sudden he's this like 1920s millionaire, so he's been, he's been ennobled but then she tells him that, you know, he has to journey along with Pinocchio in order for things to go properly, and he promises that he'll be a good conscience and do it, and he already thinks that he can do it, and that's why he's on the matchbox podium, you know, espousing his morality, but the reality turns out to be much more complex so, the bug has a little talk with the cricket, the bug has a little talk with the puppet, and the bug tries to tell Pinocchio explicitly what it means to be good, and he gets completely tangled up in the explanation, because what the hell does he know? and the, the puppet doesn't understand anything that he says anyways, and so there's a message there, and the message is the kind of knowledge that the conscience, is, that the conscience and the puppet are supposed to co-create is not something that you can articulate easily as a table of rules, it's not like that because life is too complicated to just have five rules that you live by and that will solve every problem partly because the rules will conflict that's a huge part of the problem, right? one moral guideline contradicts another in a situation, it's like, you don't know what to do so anyways, they decide that they're they decide that they're just going to he says, Pinocchio says, well, I'll be a, bo a good boy and the cricket says, well, that's the spirit and then, well, then Geppetto gets wind of it and they have a little, like, horror episode and, and then he finds out that the puppet can, is autonomous and they have a little party, which tells you exactly what Geppetto's up to, is the autonomy emerges and he's happy about it, so it's stamping home the notion that Geppetto is in fact a good guy and that that is in fact what he wants, 
So it's like the encouragement of your father is a precondition for the emergence of your individuality and, and it also allows the feminine to play a role, both as nature and perhaps as mother and, so, and the combination of those two things produces the autonomous individual It's like, well that seems perfectly reasonable So, off they go to sleep, next day they wake up, and it's a new day and and uh, Pinocchio is off to school, and that's a good thing too, because Geppetto isn't, and he's really excited about it and so what that means is that he's been parented properly, and, and he's going to go out into the world of his peers which is where he belongs, and Geppetto isn't too worried about it, in fact he, he's pushing him out the door, you know, it's like, go, you can do it, this is the next thing the kid isn't cowering in the corner and overcome by terror, and with the parents freaking out about all the things that are going to go wrong it's, there's some faith in his, his ability, so he sees all the kids wandering by, and, and Geppetto dresses them up and sends them off to school and so, and so that's good, so that's a happy family story, it's like mom and dad got together, they decided that their, the kid was going to you know, be competent and autonomous and ready to face the world, and so out he goes, and so he's like five years old at this point, or something like that, and that's where we get, that's where we're at in the story and I think that's a good place to stop, because the next thing that happens is anomaly, essentially, it's like Pinocchio goes off to be a good boy, but it turns out that that's a hell of a lot more complicated than he might think, because there are actually complications in the world, but also malevolence right, the desire for things not to go right, there are people who are not oriented towards the ideal in any way at all and Pinocchio's young and naive, and so he has no defense whatsoever against this malevolence, and that's, you know, that's not, expect, not unexpected and it also turns out that the conscience, the cricket, who is still not very clued in, oversleeps and so he's just not there at a critical moment, but I think we'll pick that up, we'll pick that up next week, because this is a good point in the plot to stop the child has entered the broader world, and has to cope with it and so, he's prepared because he had a wonderful father, and he had a magical mother, and so he's as prepared as you can be he's not even completely a marionette anymore but, but, but now it's up to him, that's the thing, now it's up to him, his parents have done basically what they could and that's really about right, you know um, it's, it's wise, I would say, psychologically so, all right that's that.